Hey, let me ask you, when's the last time you were scared? When's the last time you were alone? Uh, more than that, when's the last time you were afraid? Uh, maybe you found yourself home late one night all alone and it's dark and the electricity goes out and you're sitting there and all of a sudden you hear something downstairs. But it's not really something, it's someone. And the icy fingers of fear start to to dwell up inside of you and before long you know it, they, they've grabbed a hold of you and you've become immobilized and, and fear is one. When's the last time you were afraid? Or, or maybe it took place for you recently in the classroom or the boardroom or the conference room and you're the next one to speak. And you are competing for the grade, you're competing for the job, you're competing for the contract and you hate public speaking and now all of a sudden the person in front of you, your competitor is doing an outstanding job and you just kind of zone out and before you know it, your name's being called. And you stand up and your legs turn to rubber and your mouth turns to cotton and you're on. And all of a sudden fear's won. Or maybe it was as recently as last night. Homecoming weekend. fear in the mind of any father. Homecoming weekend, and you're in a deep sleep, and the phone rings, and it's one o'clock in the morning. Oh my goodness. I let them go to that party last night, and I let them drive. And you don't know if they're home or not, but your mind has already told you they're not home. And you can't even reach for the phone because fear is one with everything that possibly could be wrong. And you've been paralyzed. When was the last time you were afraid? When's the last time? Maybe it was recently you went to the mailbox and all the bills came on the same day. And you know exactly what you have in the bank account and you start going through them one by one by one and you're like, oh my goodness. What's going to get shut off first? The water? The electric? What are they going to come for first? The car? Are they going to come and evict us out of the apartment, evict us out of the house? When's the last time you were afraid? We're going to come to a passage of Scripture today in 1 Samuel chapter 21. If you have a Bible, let me encourage you to find one. If you didn't bring one with you to one of our parishes, they're there for you. If you don't have a Bible of your very own, would you stop by our Connect desk? We would love to give you a free copy of God's Word. We'd even, if you'd rather have it on your tablet or your, your mobile device, we'd love to show you our favorite free downloadable app that you can have the Word of God readily accessible to your fingertips. But 1 Samuel chapter 21, we're going to come across a guy named David. And in this passage of Scripture, we're going to see that David was very much afraid. David was very much afraid, which doesn't make sense to a lot of us because David was a man after God's own heart. How could God's people, one of God's people, be afraid? He was going to become a, a mighty king, and he was already a mighty warrior. How could he be afraid? It doesn't make much sense to us because those of us that, that, that have read through the Scriptures understand that 365 times in God's Word, you are commanded, do not be afraid. It's like one for every day or something like that. You know, it, it's pretty important. Don't be afraid. How could David be afraid? Remember, as he, he comes onto the scene, this is what we know about David to this point. He is a shepherd boy, and his daddy has sent his other sons off to battle. His country, the land of Israel, is doing battle with a group from Moab called the Philistines. And daddy says to David, hey, take your brother's food to the front line. So David packs up the food and he, he ventures to the front lines and he gets down there and he gives his brothers the food. And he's just supposed to check on them, see how the battle's going and go report to dad. Well, all of a sudden, it's time for the battle and the, the nation of Israel is on one side of the Valley of Elah and the, and the Philistines are on the other side of the Valley of Elah. And, and from the other side of the, the valley comes a giant warrior named Goliath. And he comes out and he taunts the nation of Israel and he taunts the living God. And he says, who will do battle against me? And all the soldiers on the other side of the land of Israel are just trembling. David's like, who's going to fight this guy? Right, nobody will stand up to him. David's like, I'll do it. And they all kind of laugh at him. No, so he goes into the king's tent. He tries on the king's armor and the armor doesn't fit. He says, this isn't me. So he puts the armor aside and he goes down to a little brook and he picks up stones and he puts them in his pouch and he goes out and he taunts back the this chief warrior Goliath, and Goliath just laughs at him and says, you're just like a little dog, I'll just kick you, and you'll all be done with you. David puts one stone in the sling and slings it, hurls it at Goliath, and it hits him in the head, knocks him down. David goes over, takes off his sword, cuts off his head. And everywhere that David goes, he's a hero. One commentator is going to say, David at this moment becomes the golden boy of Israel. 
and Saul the king makes him in charge of thousands. And every battle David fights, David wins. And every city after David has won a victory, he marches into the city and there's a song. And the song goes number one. And the song very simply is this. Saul has slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands. And King Saul doesn't like it. King Saul then remembers, "Uh uh-oh, God said that there's going to be another king that's going to take my place. This must be him. So we saw last week that Saul then makes it his mission to kill David. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times. Five times he tries to kill him. And on the fifth time that he tries to kill David, he hires assassins. And he sends the assassins, says, I know where David lives, camp, you're on a stakeout camp outside his house. When he walks out of the door in the morning, just kill him on the spot. David never comes out the door. And what we find out is that David's wife, who happens to be King Saul's daughter, lets him down the uh, window in the middle of the night, and David's on the run for his life. And David is going to run for an entire decade. I think it's the decade of his 20s. And a lot of us run from God. Chapter 21, we pick up the story. David's on the run. David went to Nob. Here's what you need to know about Nob. It is a religious city. It is filled with a place of worship. It is filled with religious priests. So David comes to Nob. He comes to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech trembled when he met David and asked, Why are you alone? And why is no one with you? Something doesn't smell quite right to this priest. Like, David, whenever you enter into a city, there's singing, there's dancing, there's shouting. The number one song on the charts is sung. Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? And David does what every good fugitive does. He lies through his teeth. David answered to him like the priest. The king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I'm sending you on. That's all I can tell you. I'm on a secret mission from the king. Okay. As for my men, I've told them to meet me at a certain place. Why, why aren't my men with me? The mission is so secret, they don't even know where we're going yet. So I've just told them to meet me over there at this certain place, and I'm going to come and I'm going to give them the battle plan. But here's what I need from you right now. Now then, David said, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. I'm hungry. I, I just had to leave so fast. I'm like, give me some bread. And so they go back and forth about the bread that, that, the, that the priest happens to have, and it's holy bread. It's bread that's in the holiest of places on the holy table. And, and sure enough, he finally agrees, and he gives David the bread. Then look at verse 8. David asked Ahimelech, do you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was so urgent. Not only am I on a secret mission, I'm on a secret urgent mission. I didn't even have time to go to my house or to the barracks and get my gear. I need a a spear. You see the two things David's asking for here, right? Provision, protection. Keep those in mind. And the priest replied, Well, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no sword here but that one. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. You get the picture, right? He says, I need food, so he gives him bread. I need a weapon. He says, the only weapon I have is the sword of Goliath. Now, here's what I need you to picture in your mind. The sword of Goliath is little or big? Huge. I appreciate that. It's huge. A sword would be strapped to your side. Now, David's the armor of the king didn't even fit David. So do you think the sword of Goliath fits David? I don't know, is it above his head? You know, it's on the other side, so he's drawn out. Is it, you just need to get this absurd picture in your head that this sword that David can't handle, the only reason he could handle it when Goliath was dead is because he could take it out with both hands and swipe his head off. But he strapped it to his leg, and he's trying to walk around, and it's just this absurd picture. He's needing protection, and he's needing provision. I skipped verse 7. It's foreshadowing. Now, one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. In just a little bit, King Saul is going to come to the region and he's going to say, David is not that good. I'm hunting him down and somebody's helping him. Who's helping him? And nobody will own up to helping. And Doag, the Edomite, said, I know, the priest over at Nob. So I was like, let's go to Nob. They go to Nob and you know what Doag does? He kills all 85 priests. He then goes to their homes, he kills their wives, and then he kills their children. Saul is serious about capturing David. David is on the run And David has to be having in his mind, he wants provision, he thinks he's got it with bread, he wants protection, he thinks he's got it with Goliath's sword. He has to be thinking in his mind, is there any place on the planet that I can go away from Saul's presence? And he comes up with one place. Look at verse 10. That day David fled from Saul 
and went to Achash, the king of Gath. Who else do you know in the scriptures is from Gath? Goliath. He goes to Goliath's hometown. Not a very smart move. Wearing Goliath's sword. One of a kind. Everybody knows what it looks like. What are you thinking, David? But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul is slain as thousands and David is tens of thousands. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence while he was in their hands. Notice he was in their hands. They've captured him. He's now a prisoner of war. They've captured him. He, he pretended to be insane uh, Pretended to be uh, insane in their presence. Uh, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. What a beautiful picture that is, right? Which, by the way, anytime you try to come up with your own provision, anytime you try to come up with your own protection, and anytime you don't deal, deal with fear, in a godly way, you'll always end up pretending like everything's okay. You'll just act. You'll, you'll just act in front of everybody. You'll put on the happy face. You'll put on the church face. You'll just, you'll just pretend like it's all okay and that fear really doesn't have a, have a hold on you. I just want you to know that's always what happens. When you try to protect yourself, when you try to provide for yourself, just know you're going to end up pretending. Achish said to his servants, Look at this man. He is insane. Why bring him to me? I love this verse. This should make you chuckle. Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on and this like this? My land is filled with madmen. I don't need another one. Thank you very much. Not in my house. Get rid of him. Chapter 22, verse 1. And David left Gath to escape to the cave of Adullam. Somehow, he's cunning intelligence. He escapes. He's on the run for his life. Turn in your Bible, if you would, to Psalm 56. Psalm 56. I shared with you last week that of these 150 songs in the, in the Psalter, in the songbook, we call it the book of Psalms. Fourteen of them have a superscription a before verse 1 that gives you a historical reference point that tells you when, something, when this song was written, what's the, what's the back story, what's going on here. So Psalm 56 says this, For the director of music, to the tune of a dove on distant oaks, a song of David, a miktam, when the Philistines had seized him in Gath, when they had their hands on him, when he was acting like a madman, when he's letting saliva roll down his beard, when he was acting, pretending to be insane, he tried to provide, he tried to protect, and the reality of it was he was very much afraid. And reflecting on this moment in his life, David writes these words. Be merciful to me, my God. My enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride they are attacking me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? All day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, hoping to take my life. Because of their wickedness, do not let them escape. In your anger, God, bring the nations down. Record my misery like tears in a bottle. Or my, is my misery not on your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know, God for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust and I'm not afraid. What can mere human beings do to me? I am under vows to you, my God. I will present my thank offerings to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. I want to share with you four words. Four words for when you're afraid. And the first word is pressure. Pressure. Would you notice with me that three times in this song, David uses these words. Uh, stanza one, all day long they press their attack. Stanza two, my adversaries pursue me all day long. And verse uh, five, all day long, 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 all day long. Morning, noon, and night, all day long, pressure. Two o'clock in the morning when I can't sleep, pressure, all day long, all day long. I'd like for you to think about it this way, please. Instead of the phrase all day long, would you think about it in terms of one more round? One more round. Last week when we started this part of the teaching series, I shared with you the quote from James J. Corbett, the first heavyweight champion uh, boxer, the first champion that when they ever started using gloves way back in the 1890s. And he said, what, what does it take to make a championship fighter? And he said, uh, the willingness to fight one more round. One more round, one more round. Some of you are listening. 
I can't go one more round with chemo. I just won't make it. If I go to the doctor and they say one more round of chemo, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's impacting my body, it's impacting my mind, it's impacting my spirit. I can't go one more round. Some of you are like, I can't go one more round of, of emergency uh, board meetings. The company is on the edge, and, and, and just one more round. I just don't know what we're going to do if it's one more round. One more, God, God, get us out of this, you know, living on the edge. Some of you are like, I can't go one more round of layoffs. I've survived every round of layoffs up to this point, and if I go into work tomorrow and the rumor is there's going to be one more round of layoffs, God, I just don't think I'm going to survive. One more round. One more round. Some of you are like, I cannot go one more round with my teenager. Every turn, we're banging heads. I'm about ready to lose it. If they, if they don't get it, I just don't think I'll survive one more round. I think if, if we go at this again one more round, they're, they're going to leave and they're going to be gone for good. Some of you are like, I cannot go one more round with my parents. They are crazy. I walk into the house and I feel the tension and they, man, they got it down. They can pretend like nobody else can pretend. Nobody else in the world would know what my family is going through. And I just don't think I can survive one more round with my parents. I need them to come clean. I need them to be honest. can't go one more round. Some of you are like, I don't think I can go one more round with my spouse. We've been down this road 600 times. One more time? Seriously, God? One more time? One more round? What's your one more round? One more round without a raise? One more round of exams? I don't know. One more round. One more round. Did, did you notice how David handles one more round? See how this song starts? Be merciful to me, God. David prays. David prays like there is a God. David prays like there is a God who hears. David prays like there is a God who listens. And David prays like there is a God who cares. And he begs, God, be merciful to me. The Hebrew word for merciful here, I think a better translation might be, God, be gracious. We, 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 be gracious. It's the word that consistently used in the scriptures when God talks to us about how we're to treat the poor and the needy. It's the word that God uses when he tells those who are, who are going to be farmers in the Older Testament. He says, when, when you harvest your, your crops and your land and your grapes, don't harvest all the way to the edges. Leave some at the very edges of the field for the poor, for the widow, for the orphan, and for the foreigner. See, what God is saying here is, I want you to be proactive to the needs of others. Other people are going to have needs, and, and so don't harvest all the way to the edges. And what David is asking, God, I need you to be proactive to my needs. I need you to treat me like you want me to treat those who are poor and needy because, God, right now I'm poor and needy. God, be, be gracious to me. God, I'm trusting you for my provision. I'm trusting you for my protection. I think David figured out. When he trusted himself for provision, he trusted himself for protection. It only led to pretending. God, I need you to deal with the pressure because I can't take one more round. The second word I want you to think about is the word fear. If you notice how it's used three times, verse 3, verse 4, and in verse 11. When I am afraid, by the way, that translation, when I am afraid, literally reads, on the day that I am afraid. You know what I think the songwriter's saying? That most of us even know the day we're going to be afraid. And there's some of you celebrating, not celebrating, there's some of you uh, observing the one-year anniversary of the death of a parent. And you knew this day was coming. And you knew it was going to be filled with fear. And there's some of you who face doctor's appointment this week. Wednesday at 3 o'clock. And in that moment, you know there's going to be fear. And, and the songwriter says, on, on that moment, in that time when I'm afraid, I'll trust in you. Then look, he says in 4, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I am not afraid. Verse 11, in God I trust, I am not afraid. It's it's the concept of fear. I, I want you to see the, the concept of fear not from an Old Testament perspective, but from a New Testament perspective. Maybe, maybe the, the most famous verse about fear in all the scriptures is Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid. But in the Newer Testament, I think the most famous verse on fear comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 is written by a guy named Paul to a young preacher kid named Timothy who's afraid. 
He's afraid that he's too young to do the job. He's afraid that he's too young and people are making fun of him. He's afraid that he's, he's too young. In fact, we find as we read First and Second Timothy that Timothy wants to leave the city. And Paul says, stay there. And this is what Paul writes. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The word Paul uses for fear consistently throughout the New Testament scriptures is a military word. And it means to run away from battle. It's used of a soldier who leaves the front lines and walks what we might say it's a soldier who goes AWOL. Who says, I don't want to fight. I don't want to be under the uh, orders of my superior officers. I just quit. I give up. And Paul says, that's not the kind of spirit God's given you. And so when it comes to fear, most of us want to run away. And we'll even go to a foreign country, to the land of Goliath, our biggest giant, carrying his sword where everybody in the world recognizes us just to try to get away from it. Right? How many of you remember in, in any of the movies those, those famous jump scenes? Uh, those jump scenes. The, the first one I can ever remember seeing Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Butch and Sundance up on the hill, and they, they, they're getting chased, and they run to the cliff, and the water's below them, and they, they got to leap, right? Any other movies that you can think of that have a famous jump scene? The Fugitive? Yeah, The Fugitive. Richard Kimball there, and, you know, being chased, standing there, and he just jumps. Why do you jump? You jump because the water below might kill you, but you know the people behind you are going to kill you. And that's the situation you're in. And you're about ready to jump because you're just afraid. Fear. Fear. That's the second word. The third word is trust. I just want to challenge you, don't run away from the battle. The third word is trust. Notice every time, 3, 4, and 11, it says, I am afraid. Uh, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, I am not afraid. I will trust in you consistently. By the way, the opposite of fear is not unfear. The opposite of fear is trust. That's your choice. Be afraid or trust. Uh, I shared with you last week that in Hebrew, the, the, there are three words consistently used for trust. And the first word means to seek refuge. It means to be put in a place where you're inaccessibly high from your enemy. The second word is to lean on, and the third word is to just throw all your weight on. Uh, put together in their whole, I think you could summarize, anytime you see the word trust in the scriptures, it means to rely on. To rely on. When I'm afraid, I will rely on God. And so I've given you a verse on your teaching outline, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, that my parents made me memorize when I was a little kid, and, and I memorized it this way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. In that passage of Scripture, Proverbs chapter 3, I want you to see three things. I want you to see that there are three commands and one declaration. I want you to see that there are three imperatives and one promise. Maybe I could put it this way. There are three things that are your responsibility, and there's one thing that's God's responsibility. The three commands, very simply, are trust, lean not, and acknowledge. To trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I think it means this. Rely on God without reservation. Rely on God without reservation. Seek refuge, lean on, trust him, rely on him without reservation. Responsibility number one, you're going to rely on something. I've listed for you on your teaching outline, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 28. I'm so excited about the progress so many of you are making, uh, teenagers and adults in the Project Freedom and in the, in, the, in the Financial Peace University. Proverbs 11:28 reminds us, uh, people who trust in the riches, who rely on their riches, will fail. This is not about getting money so you can rely on your money. This is about finding that the blessing of God is your greatest wealth. Okay? So there, there's that. There's trust in God without reservation. The second one, lean not on your own understanding. The scripture writer here, the songwriter, is brilliant. You notice what he does here? He, he does a play on words. One of the definitions for trust is lean on, right? He says, lean on God totally. Don't lean on yourself at all. In private this week, I tried. I cannot figure out how it's physically possible to lean on yourself. I tried. I look pretty stupid. If you know how to do it, if you know how to, I can lean to the left, lean to the right, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. You know, I can, I can do that kind of leaning. But I cannot lean on myself. I can lean on the podium. I can lean on my neighbor. I can't, to, to lean on by its very definition is, is to transfer weight onto something else. I cannot lean on myself. If you know how to do it, I would love to, to know. I'd actually like to watch you try. <laughs> and just as ridiculous as it would be to try to lean on myself physically, the songwriter is saying, it's just, just 
silly. It's insane, if you will, to try to lean on your own understanding. David tries to lean on his own understanding, and he ends up pretending like a madman. Then in all third, the third command is acknowledge. The word translated acknowledge means one of two things. It means to recognize. Recognize God's presence. David was with a priest. David was in the holiest of places, and he never even recognized God's presence. But the word also means to submit, and none of us like that word. It means to submit to God's plan and God's way. So my task are to trust, lean not, and to acknowledge, recognize, submit to God. God's part, that's my part. God's part, very simply, his promise is to direct my steps, to make my path straight, to smooth out the way for me. Four words, pressure, fear, trust. And the fourth one is worship. And the fourth one is worship. Look what the songwriter says, verse 4, in God whose word I praise, Verse 10, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. And then verse 12, uh, verse t- uh, yeah, 12, for I'm under vows to you, my God, I'll present my thank offerings to you. You've kept me from stumbling so that I might walk in the light of life. The scriptures say, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Worship. Worship starts with what this songwriter calls praise. In God whose word I praise. Consistently, in God, whose word I praise. The Hebrew word for word is the bar. We see it all the way back in Genesis 1, the beginning. In the beginning, God said, and it was so, and it was good. When God speaks, God speaks good things. When God speaks, he brings beauty out of chaos. That's what happens when God speaks his word. God's beautiful word speaks peace, not fear. But more than that, I'd like for you to think about this when you see the word word in the scriptures. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as if the only begotten son of God, full of grace and truth. When God speaks a word, the word is Jesus. When God speaks a word, it is grace. When God speaks a word, it is truth. Part of worship is learning to hear God speak to your life. God speaks through his word. God speaks to you through circumstances. God speaks to you through His Spirit. God speaks to you through others who are walking with God. You have to learn to hear God speak. But more importantly than anything else today, I just want to ask you, if, if, you've, been, if you've been facing fear, trying to come up with your own protection and your own provision, have you ever trusted in the gift of Jesus Christ? The Scriptures say that all of us have sinned. The Scriptures say that the result of our sin is death, separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The scriptures say if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, you'll have provision, you'll have protection. I just want to ask you, have you ever said yes to the word of God through Jesus Christ? You've never said yes to the gift of God by trusting in in his word, by trusting in his son Jesus. I want to ask you, I want to beg you to do that today. The first step to overcoming fear is trusting in Jesus, relying totally and completely on what he did on the cross Take care of your sin. Some of you have done that, and you're still living in fear. And I just want to ask you, why? Why? Will you not trust in God's word? When God speaks, he speaks good things. Then he says, I'll I'll give my thank offering. I don't know what the thank offering was. The scripture doesn't tell us. It could have been the gift that David gave at the end of his life to build the temple, maybe. But all I know is that part of worship involves giving. And then it says, you keep my feet from stumbling so that I might walk in the light of life. Remember, I read chapter 21 of 1 Samuel to you. I also read the first verse of chapter 22. Where's David when he writes this song? He's in a cave. In your mind, is a cave full of light or full of darkness? Darkness. David, I don't want to live in the dark anymore. God, I want to walk in freedom. I want to walk in light. That's the promise of God is your freedom. The fourth word is worship. Here's what I want to give you. Four things and we'll be done. I want to give you a fearless prayer. A fearless prayer because there's going to come a day when you're afraid again. It's going to happen. It happened to David. It's going to happen to you. How do I fear less? And it's taken right out of Psalm 56. Four things. But here's the deal. I can't make the practical or personal application for you today. You have to do it. I can start you down the path. I can start you on the sentence, but you have to fill in the blank. 
Sense number one is this. God, be gracious to me. I can't take one more round of. How do you fill in the blank? God, I, God, I just can't take one more round. I can't take it. God, I've tried to provide. I've tried to protect myself from it. And I've just resulted in pretending, God, be gracious. I can't take one more round. Fill in the blank. Second, God, I will trust you. The scriptures say you're going to trust something, some interest in horses, some interest in chariots, some interest in riches, but the songwriter consistently says, I am not afraid, I will trust in you. God, I trust you. Fill in the blank, God, I trust you for protection, provision. What what, what are you trusting God for today? Get specific. Uh, Third, I will not fear. I will not fear. Fill in the blank. What is it that has you afraid today? I will not fear. And then finally, for your fearless prayer, I will worship because you have spoken. What's God spoken into your life? Hopefully he's spoken the name Jesus, grace and truth, peace and protection and provision. Those four sentences for a fearless prayer, and I promise you, if you'll pray those, as if you believe there's a God, if He hears, if He listens, and if He cares, you will fear less. One thing we haven't talked about. Worst case scenario. Whatever you're fearing, what is the worst case scenario? See, most of us, when we think about the worst case scenario, it leads us to more fear instead of to more trust. The songwriter intentionally twice deals with the worst case scenario. Did you catch it? Verse 4, In God whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid, what can mere mortals do to me? Again in verse 11, In God I trust and I am not afraid, what can mere human beings do to me? David assumes, head on, the the worst case scenario. What's the worst thing that human beings could have done to him? Anybody? Kill him. Kill him. For those of you going through FPU, you're getting to hear Dave Ramsey on a consistent basis. I want to share with you a quote that I pulled out of Dave Ramsey's book, Entree Leadership. It's a great book on leadership. And Dave Ramsey says this. He says, I am amazed at how much power it gives me when I emotionally digest and accept the absolute worst-case scenario. One more time. I am amazed at how much power it gives me when I emotionally digest and accept the absolute worst-case scenario. My friend, you've got to think about the worst-case scenario. And when you will deal with it, and let it lead you to trust, it will change your life. What's your worst-case scenario today? Do you trust God with it? There's a historical figure named John Chrysostom. Chrysostom lived in the late 300s, mid-400s A.D. Chrysostom was known across the ancient world for traveling the ancient world, proclaiming the truth about who Jesus was. And he did it in places where it was not accepted. He did it in places where it could cost you his life. He did it once in a land where the queen's name was Eudoxia. And Eudoxia confronted him and, and said that Chrysostom said, I demand that you stop telling people the truth about, stop telling people about Jesus Christ. If you do not, I will banish you from this land. Queen, you cannot banish me. For the earth is my father's home. I will be at home wherever you send me. Then I will kill you. Queen, you cannot. Because my life is hid with Christ and God and heaven is my home. Then I will take away all your treasures. (laughs) Queen, you cannot. For my treasure is hidden in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. You cannot take my treasures from me. Then I will put you on an island so far out there that you will be alone the rest of your life, separated from anybody, family and friend. Queen, you cannot. For I have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And whatever you do, you may not separate me from him. I defy you, queen. Do what you must but you will never be able to harm me. For I trust in God. Almighty God, 
We trust in you. Because you have spoken the word of Jesus into our lives. He is our provision and he is our protection. So Father, I just ask now for my brothers and sisters who are wrestling with fear, trying to find ways to provide and protect God, that they would simply say, God, today I I choose to trust you. I will trust in you. Father, some for the very first time maybe need to trust in the gift of Jesus and might say a prayer like this, God, I, I understand that I need the provision of salvation that Jesus offers. I don't get it all, but I acknowledge my sin and I ask that Christ would forgive my sin. I believe that he's your son, the living word that he rose from the dead so that I might live. God, the best I know how, I ask him to come into my life and forgive my sin. God, I want to live the rest of my days walking in the light of life. God, for those of us that have prayed prayed a prayer like that some time ago, we we still wrestle with fear. And it's going to come today or tomorrow or next week or next month. God, when it does, we want to be better prepared. So God, would you teach us? Would you be merciful to us? Would you be gracious? Would you prepare in advance our protection and our provision? May you help us see it so that we can acknowledge it and and take hold of it. And God, whatever that worst case scenario is today, may we confront it head on because you're with us and you love us and you care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you made a decision today, we'd love to know about that. You can fill out a card. You can put it in one of the baskets. You can connect with us electronically. I'd love to get an email or a a phone call or a text message from you. We'd love to help you. If we can help you in any way on your spiritual journey, we'd love to do that. If you came ready to give today, uh, there are joy baskets around the room. If you want to give and you're watching online, there are ways to give electronically. You can sign up to to give. And if you came today and you're in one of the parishes and aren't able to give, uh, didn't bring a check or, or cash with you and you'd like to give, we have giving kiosks located throughout the building if you'd like to to give that way. Would you stand with me for a word of blessing and and benediction? Again, if we can help you on your spiritual journey, we'll be hanging around down front. We'd love to meet you and talk with you and pray with you. Now, brothers and sisters, until we meet together again in this place, should our Lord Jesus not return, may God be gracious to you. May you recognize his provision and his protection. May you choose trust And may you know his presence. And as you go from this place, may you go in the peace and the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Peace be with you. We'll see you next week.